Hey everyone, it's Jason. Welcome to another Funkover Strategy Game uh, Unboxing Component video. Today is the Universal Monsters. Uh, so this is a really fun uh, big game based set um, because it has the classic monsters. We have Dracula, Invisible Man, uh, Creature from the Black Lagoon, and the Bride of Frankenstein. So I'm really hoping they release um, more sets for this. Either some small Two, two character expansions or another big box. Um, because there's definitely a lot more characters that could be added. Um, if you're not familiar with the Funko game, it is a, basically a quick, uh, a quickish strategy type game. Because it's all based on moving, um, doing special abilities with your characters. Um, so you're trying to knock out your rivals, um, or collect points to score in some different ways. And there's some various different game modes included in every box. Uh, but overall, every Funkoverse game, the core rules all play the exact same. Um, and then there's a little bit differences between um, each game can have a little bit, a little bit of changes here and there. Um, but they're all mixed and matchable, which is what makes them really fun. So you can play the Universal Monsters with Marvel and DC characters, or Jurassic Park, um, or Alice in Wonderland, Peter Pan. You could bring in. Giz, you know, you know, other sets like that. So it's definitely very cool. Um, so a lot of different components, but once you start breaking them all down, they all aren't too terribly bad. Um, so each character is have a character card, and I'll go into more details on each card as we look at them. Um, but you're gonna have character cards and have some cool down tracks. Um, Basic setup of the board is very simple. They're, like, you're going to look at the map. It's, the scenario thing is going to tell you how to do it. Um, and you have all your cards set out. So different character cards, their tokens. Um, if they have any special item cards, you're going to get them. And this is showing 2v2 two, two two games. Um, so what do you get to do on your turns? So what you're going to be doing is playing on one of these big old maps here. So this is just part of the map. And you're going to have your characters, if I can pop them out of the box. So, if I have Bride of Frankenstein here, and I have the creature, they're going to be doing different things to either move around the board, um, or they're going to be attacking each other with various dice rolls. Um, so they're trying to collect points that are lay laying on the board using various tokens or special uh, crystals in the game that we get to use to mark tokens. They will roll special dice um, to try and take each other out doing various challenges. So that's the idea of the game. That's kind of what you're doing there. So on your turn you get various actions. You get to do two actions per turn. Move two spaces, challenge, rolling two dice, uh, assist, which stands up an ally who's been knocked down. So if an ally loses a challenge, they get knocked down. If they lose a second challenge, they get knocked out, which removes them from the board for a period of time. Um, or you can interact with things on the board. Um, lots of characters have special abilities. They have items they can use. And then, not listed on here, but some of the games have companions, which are an extra, like, um, minor ally you can have added. Stuff like Tinkerbell, um, or Zero from um, Nightmare Before Christmas, stuff like that. Uh, then, third thing you do is rally. If your character has been knocked down, you can, instead of doing any action, you can stand them up instead. Um, or you can, then, for you exhaust your character, basically saying, hey, I've used... One of my two characters, now the next player gets to go. Then when it's my turn, I have to use the non-exhausted one. Um, end of the round, you have a cooldown track. Um, which you'll move your tokens and characters off of. So as you use abilities, you'll put them. You'll put a token on your track. Um, so if it's on three, then at the end of the round it goes down to two. And then the next round it goes down to one. Then after that, it leaves the board. Or... If your character gets knocked out, they get put on here, and then at the next round they get removed and they get put back on the game. Um, it's just a fun little way to like, uh, kind of like timing, timing of abilities, so you can't spam abilities over and over. Uh, then the book does a good idea of going, going through and explaining how challenges work. 
um, and movement where it's the basic idea of a challenge. You roll, if you get the star symbol, it's a success, and exclamations are three successes. Then if the rival gets a shield, that's a success for them for defending, or three for an exclamation point. You have more successes, you win the challenge. Um, and that's basically another game they even recommend right now. Just stop, play a game. Don't have any special rules. Don't don't play any of the scenarios or special things. Just put your characters on a board, have each other attack each other, have each other maybe collect points, do things like that. Um, and that goes through and does a very good job of explaining uh, line of sight for what your characters can and can't see, who they can see through movement, where you can and can't move, how you can move, all of that. Um, diving more into basic challenges, um, knocking out targets, stuff like that, ranged, and I'm not going to get all that. Scenario setup, um, and then we have the four different types of abilities. We have blue, red, gray, and yellow. So blue are uh, agility, fitness, coordination abilities. Um, red are force militia, strength, uh, gray are cun cunning, ingenuity, deception, and yellow is leadership and charisma and willpower. Um, so it's kind of just their basic idea, giving an idea of what type of ability that character is going to use. Um, and now, not every game uses all all four different colors. Some games you have characters that only use one or two. Um, it's kind of neat. And then you'll know, playing with items, bonus objectives, things like that, companions if you're going to use those and how to mix everything together. Um, very, very simple. Then lots of other rules and stuff like that, which I don't want to get all into. So we're going to look at a couple of the components and then we'll look at the characters. So one thing that definitely makes this set more unique than any other set is because it is um, Universal Monsters, which were old black and white movies, Everything in here is black and white or, you know, a shade of some sort of shade of gray. Um, versus the other games, it can be very colorful. Um, so that's, that's kind of a neat idea that they did. They could have made it all fully colored, had these guys been like more modern colors. I like the idea that they went the old school. Um, so you're going to get two of these cooldown trackers, one for each player. So even if I am playing with four characters and I'm playing a 4v4 game, I'll use the same tracker for each one. Although... If you do have a four, if you have multiple sets, then you could you'll have more trackers to use if you would like to. Um, so we have a pile of cards here. Sorry, um, we're gonna which we'll go over a little bit more detail. We have some other basic character cards. We have skill cards and item cards, and then we have the actual character cards, uh, which I want to go into a little bit more detail in just a moment. We have our scenarios. These are going to be the four different uh, basic types of games we can play. Uh, leaders, scrimmage, flags, and control. Um, and you can always make up your own games. Or if you buy different expansions, some have other ones. Space Jam has a basketball one. Alice in Wonderland has Crotay. Marvel has some special ones with like Thanos using the Infinity Stones. Um, or the base set using some... Uh, computer and different items and stuff. So yeah, picking up different games can definitely expand that way for you because it'll give you different modes of play. Um, so we do want to look at our tokens and stuff here. So again, we had our dice, which you're going to have shields on two sides, the burst challenge symbol on, on the other sides, and one side is going to have the exclamation point. This set also comes with a special red die. Uh, which I believe is Dracula's Blood Die, which has no defense, uh, just attacks. Um, so that's going to only be used in specific situations. So again, some characters get neat things like that. Then we have these little crystals that we get to use uh, to keep track of points. Uh, so when you score a point, you get to take one of these crystals. They could be on the board or something you could collect, things like that. Um, every game has a different color. This game, of course, because it's black and white, they're gray. Um, which that definitely makes them kind of cool. Uh, then we're going to get bases and items. So we'll look at the items when we look over the character cards. The bases are to help the character stand. Uh, although he's standing fairly well, the creature you can see how if I'm trying to move him, he could fall over. Uh, Bride of Frankenstein, however, has a fairly 
fat base. She's pretty much fine. So it's it's for that. It's also to keep track of whose team is whose. So if you have all four characters out, one team's the white team, one team's the black team. Um, lots of times it's used for the good guy versus the bad guy. Um, this game, I don't know if the Roy is technically a good guy or a bad guy. Or if you're mixing and matching with other sets. It just helps keep track of them. Um, so we'll look at that in a moment. Uh, first we want to dump out all of these tokens. So we have a lot of them. Um, we're going to get crystal point tokens. So these will go on the board. They have A, B, C, D. So sometimes um, a match will tell you where to put A, B, C, or D. Other times you just want to use the point side to show where crystals are supposed to go on the board if you're playing. Hey, this is where I spawn a crystal at the end of every round or however you want to do that. Um, you get a bunch of those. We have exhausted tokens so you can put these little guys on top of your characters to show they're exhausted. We have um, other objective markers. So we have some that are square and some that are flags and they're or stars and they're double sided. So like this could be for player A, this could be for the white player, for the black player. Um, it's just one different way to keep track of them. And then the same thing, we have a flag and star for each color. So you can keep track of them for those modes. Um, other ones we're going to have is, it looks like we have some special tokens for one of the characters. So I'm not sure who these are for off the top of my head. So we'll set those aside and look at them when we get there. As well as we have these special tokens, which we'll also look at. We got three of those. And again, I think the black side and the white side are again. So if you're playing the black side character, you know that that's yours versus somebody else's in case they might for some reason have um, an ability like that. We have a little blood token, which we'll get to. We have the first player token, just to keep track of who's the first player. Uh, we have some basic characters. These are kind of fun. They add in extra basic characters. So if for some reason you're playing like a two-player game, um, or you only want to control one character, you have a second character that's just a basic one, or if this, you could play three versus three. Um, and we'll look at those guys a little bit more. Then we have a bunch of ability tokens. Now, the ability tokens will match your character cards. So... On the bottom of each character's card, it'll show which tokens, oops, which token they get. So, the Bride is going to get a red and blue. Dracula will get a gray and red. Visible Man gets a gray and blue. And the Creature gets a red and blue. Um, so, that's how you divvy up those different tokens. So, you notice like I said there's no yellow in this set, which is more of a leader, leadership type token. Not really a lot of leaders in a set of monsters. Um, but again, how these will work is... Um, so if like, I spend... If I want to use Grave Robbing Ability, I'll take this blue token and I'll put it on her cooldown track. So this goes on the one spot. Um, and then next turn, it eggs off. Now I have this token available to use again. Um, but now if we're looking at someone like Dracula, if he has his Mesmerize for three, I put it up on three... Now, my other token's red. I don't have access to this until end of the turn, cools down. End of the turn, cools down. Three turns later, now I can use this again. So you kind of got to bounce their abilities out based on their tokens, which is really a neat idea. All right. Um, why don't we jump in and look at the characters then, as long as we are already looking at them. So let's look at good old Count Dracula. If I can get him out of here. So here's his little miniature. Um, definitely cool. Swick the back hair. Now they all have one open hand here. And this is for the items. Um, almost every single Funko Verse game. Comes with items. If I can get them out of here. So this one comes with a shovel and a net. So I can give the shovel... To go go Dracula if I would like. Um, it can go with somebody else. It doesn't matter. Um, I mean, it doesn't matter who technically has it. Like anyone can use any item. Even though like thematically the shovel is probably for. Um, might be for like uh, the bride. And the net might be for um, the creature. 
you can use them with anybody. Or you can mix and match them to other sets. Um, you get the Arigasco set. She comes with a chainsaw. You could give Dracula a chainsaw. You could have Rick and Morty mixed in here and give uh, Rick a shovel. Um, so there's lots of different fun things there. So let's look at what Count Vlad, Dracula, Tempest, all his different names is. So on the bottom here, we have a defense. He has a defensive one, which isn't very typical. Most characters have two defense. But he has the bloody terror of Transylvania. Uh, Dracula has plus one defense while the blood token is on your cooldown track. There we go. When the Dracula does a challenge, you may shift the blood token uh, down one and add the blood and add the blood die to the roll. If you don't, place the blood token on the three on your cooldown track. Okay, so that's kind of cool. So you have this blood token, and it, it'll be on your track. Um, so if it's not on there now, basically you do is... Um, it says, during your turn, it says, when he does a challenge, you may shift his token down one. So if you do too many in a row, um... You just use that blood die, which had a lot more actions and no misses. Essentially, you can't miss with it. So that's very nice. You're going to guarantee hits with that. Um, but you have to shift this down once. Use it too many times, it's going to shift off the board. Um, so basically, either you're going to end up with a thing of if you don't, if you do a challenge, you choose not to. So if it's on um, spot one, you can choose not to use the die and put the blood token back to three. Or if it's shifted off the board already, uh, because you did too many actions in a row, then you did put it back on three. Um, and while it's on there, he has his two defense. So there are going to be various times if you let it fall off the board that he gets that he drops back down to one. Uh, his first ability, which is two gray, is the blood is the life. Uh, stand Dracula up or shift him off your cooldown track. Dracula may use his ability when knocked down or on the cooldown track. Okay, so that's cool. So basically, he can uh, spend this one ability to just stand up um, if he's knocked down, or just to get him back on the board, rather than having to spend the entire turn doing that. So then he still gets one extra action. Uh, so it's actually pretty cool. Uh, Mesmerize has a little hit symbol after it, which means it's a challenge ability. So it says, pull a rival, Dracula can see two squares, then do a basic challenge. Oh, so that's fun. So you can bring guys next to him. So um, you can get them closer so he can do damage to them. And then X Sanguinite. Uh, challenge 5. Reduce the cost of this ability by 2 when targeting a knocked down character. Okay, so this is kind of cool. So he could essentially on his turn do Mesmerize, pull a guy towards you, uh, and do a basic challenge. If he knocks them down... He could then use his second ability, um, which normally costs four, but he could drop it down to two, um, so he can use it quicker to knock them. If he knocks them, if they're knocked down, he can knock them out, so he can do a double whammy. But it also means that then both of his tokens are on the board, so that means his next turn, uh, he won't have any, um... He won't have any abilities to use. But also he's doing Mesmerize. If he has his blood token on. He can actually add that to help guarantee some hits for that one. Uh, so it's kind of a cool little character. A little bit different design. Um, which is definitely the fun part about all of these characters. Up next we have the Bride. So here's the Bride. Her big old fat hair. Um, which I'm sure they would have liked to make longer. She has some bandaged up arms. And then of course she has her hand holding item. She has made me from dead. Oh, that's right. She has some really unique cards here. Um, I forgot about this. I did I, I don't I didn't look at these too much earlier. Um the Bride of Frankenstein gains traits and abilities printed on the bride status card she has been given. When the Bride of Frankenstein is giving a fourth Bride status card, shift two ability tokens off your cooldown track. Okay, so we'll look at those in a minute. But she has one is Grave Robbing. Doing interact action, give the Bride of Frankenstein a Bride status card. Move one. And then she is alive. Challenge three. If you win, 
give the Bride of Frankenstein a Bride status card. So most characters have three abilities. She only has two. Um, and both of them are attempts to give her status cards. So the characters are going to have status cards. Not every character gets one. Like Dracula didn't have any. He has his blood token instead. But she's going to get these cards. They are going to be... She walks. So now she gets the ability to move three to do a basic challenge. She could get... She breathes to a challenge to each rival within two squares. She sees the Bride of Frankenstein can assist allies and interact with things she can see within two squares. Or she hears. Send the Bride of Frankenstein up. The Bride of Frankenstein can do this while knocked down. So she can potentially gain four more abilities. Um, and three of them actually do some... Uh, this one lets her move and do a challenge, basic challenge, which isn't bad at all. Um, this one lets her do a big challenge to multiple people. So she can take out multiple guys. It costs her four, um, but she can definitely do it. She has the hears, which will let her uh, stand up if knocked down, uh, which is a very nice ability to do. We saw Dracula had an ability like that as well. And then she has this one, can let her interact with allies or other things from farther away. So it's definitely cool. What's also neat about this, if we didn't, you didn't see this from before, is that when you get all four of them, they form a picture of her. Um, this is the first character in all the Funko games that has had this ability. So this is really cool. Um, I only worry that if they made a Frankenstein, they'd try and repeat this type of ability. But I'm even not against that. Um, we've had other characters that have special dice, like, um, uh, like Dracula. But I wouldn't even actually honestly care if they did repeat that with Frankenstein. Give them different types of abilities. Maybe a little bit more aggressive. Um... But that is definitely a neat idea. Alright, up next we have the Invisible Man. Claude Rains. Uh, so what is neat about this is there is a chase version you can get. Um, so on the outside of the box, I have a little yellow circle that says... Uh, that says chase. So you can see when you go to pick up the game if it's a chase figure and it's him invisible. Um, I do not have that. If I definitely, if I can find that set, I'll probably buy it. I don't want to buy every chase figure for these Funko games because some of them aren't as cool. Um, or I don't need both versions like I have. I do have like Bugs Bunny who's Flock, which is kind of cool. He's a furry character. And I have um, Queen of Hearts who's Glittered. Which is kind of neat. She's glittery. It kind of works for her. But, like, I didn't pick up the Peter Pan one who's flocked. Because a non-fuzzy character being flocked doesn't make sense. But I would love to have an invisible version of him. Kind of like I have the Jaws shark which has blood on his, on his mouth. <laughs> it doesn't play any differently. It doesn't do anything different for the game other than that. But here he is in his iconic bathrobes. And his... I love his big thick glasses. How they did that for the game. Um... Alright, so what does the Invisible Man do for us? Elusive Trickster. Rivals can only see the Invisible Man while they're adjacent to him. So that's actually kind of funny. Um, he can't be seen unless you're standing right next to him. So if he's across the board, basically he doesn't exist. Uh, he has Strangle. Challenge 3. Roll one extra die while targeting a knocked down character. Makes sense. Um, sneaking. Move to give the Invisible Man the sneaking card. So he gets his own special status card, which says sneaking. That's kind of neat. So there's like, this would be kind of a neat way, reason to have the, uh, Invisible version. Because you could swap out the model for this. At the start of the Invisible Man's turn, if no rival can see him, uh, he may do an action. After the Invisible Man rallies or does an action, discard this card. Um... He'll basically get a free action as long as no one can see him. And nobody can see him unless they're right next to him. Um, so that's kind of cool. So you can combo that. Uh, move 2, he gets to move move away from guys. So now he's invisible. And then you get to use this to get a free action on the beginning of your turn. So that's kind of fun. Uh, and then Reign of Terror. Move 2, push an adjacent rival to squares. Again, that's helpful to get guys away from you. Because always invisible, he doesn't have to worry about getting knocked down because they can't target him at range. 
Um, they can't see him for doing challenges or things like that, so they have to move, they have to spend time moving right next to them. Um, so, like, you know, there's, like, Dracula, uh, Mesmerized, can see, uh, Dr pull a rival, Dracula can see two squares away. Can't see him, doesn't, doesn't affect him. Or the bride had hers, which was, um... Yeah. Do a challenge within three. Each rival within two squares. As long as he's more than one square away, that doesn't work. But it also goes this way. She sees. Interact with assist allies. So if he gets knocked down, then Briar Frankenstein can't help him from two spaces away because she like walks over and bumps into him. Um, so that's definitely a neat character. Then our final character is the creature. The creature from the Black Lagoon. I love this model. Too. I love these models of all of these guys. Uh, they're very detailed. Um, again, they could have easily have just made these Funko type games. Someone could have said, hey, here's this idea. We're going to use standees. Um, and it would have worked just as well. Um, but yeah, they added these cool characters. So we have the creature has Forbidden Depths. At the start of the creature's turn, you may place a tunnel token in its, in its square. When it moves, squares with the tunnel are considered adjacent to other squares with tunnels within five squares. Rivals may interact with tunnels to discard them. So he's going to get three tunnel tokens. So he can place these around the board, and it lets it move up to five squares away. So he can drop one, move five squares away, drop another one. Move five squares away, drop another one. And now you can go from that first one back to the... From that third one back to the first one. So he could potentially move 15 spaces very quickly. Um, and the opponents can interact to get rid of them. But that pulls them away from doing other stuff. Um, so suddenly you can drop one like right next to your starting area. And then get... Eventually have him move across the board. Um, yeah, so it's kind of cool. Now, the only thing I wonder is, it says, um, rivals may interact to discard, uh, discard them. So, I wonder if allies can use the tunnel. Um, it's possible to move tunnels consecutively, so you can move, you know, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, it does not specify if other characters can use that. That's kind of what I was... Um, curious about. Um. Yeah. It doesn't specify. So it might be something you'd have to house rule. If another character can use his tunnels or not. I would argue no. Because it's supposed to be his ability. But, you know, you can always play it by ear. He has Slashing Claws. Challenge 3. Challenge two to a different rival. Ooh, that's fun. You just hit multiple guys. Abduct. Choosing an adjacent character. Move one. Uh, place that character on the adjacent square. So you just to grab them and move them. Now, it does say in the uh, FAQ on here. Um, How is the creature's abduct worth a tunnel? If the creature abducts through a tunnel, it can take adjacent characters with it all the way to the other side. So that is kind of interesting. So you could use that to pull a, a rival across the board. Or you could pull an ally uh, to the other side. Either out of harm's way or into where you need him to be. Um, yeah, it's so cool. And then it's Aquatic Ambush. Place a tunnel token in a square thing. Two squares, move, and then go a basic challenge. Okay, so that's cool. So at the start of your turn, you can place a token in a quark ambush like you pull another one. Now, the thing would be, what if you run out of tokens? You only have three. You're going to have to remove one somewhere. Um, now, this again, like I was talking about buying a second set. So if I could get the invisible one, I would technically have six tokens. You can go ahead and argue. You could have all six tokens out if you wanted to. Maybe give this guy an extra handicap or something. Maybe like make forbidden depths like cost one action to do or um or something like that you could do something or just or not even have it cost you can still put one down every turn um but maybe you can only place up to three that way you know i don't know you could do something different that'd be kind of a neat little idea to play with all right so then the next thing we have for characters is we have two basic cards 
We have a mad scientist and a villager. And then these are kind of represented just by little tokens. One black, one white to match each team. Um, and these, like, they usually have these in the two-player sets. You have a second character. But here you can use it if you want to have a three-player team. Um, and they're just tokens to give you extra little abilities. So they have move, challenge, assist, interacting ally. So other than the fact they're tokens, they work like any other character. They just don't have them extra special abilities. Um, so I'd say first first time you play, if you want to play three versus three, um, you know, definitely be fun. Someone could have that. Or if you're playing a three-player game, 2v2 versus two. So like one player gets two regular characters. Each other player gets a uh, main character. And then one of the other ones maybe is a handicap. Um, you know, something like that. Or buy more sets and you just not worry about using these characters anymore. So I think what most people do. Then we have items. We have two item cards in this set. We have the fishing net. There's the little fishing net. Which let's give that to the. Uh... Now he's walking around with the fishing net. Uh, so the fishing net says. i zoom in there a little bit. Has range 3. Challenge 2. Pull the target 2 squares. So that's kind of cool. So you can range 3. You can pull a guy forward. Um, if you, if you complete the challenge, you can pull them towards you. So that kind of gets them close to some melee attacks or pulls them away. Um, and then it has a two on here for the cooldown. So when you use this, it, you take that item card now and you put it on the cooldown track two. So it's going to take two turns to use a gang. Um, and then the second one is we had the shovel, if you've seen before. Um, so the shovel has a three cost. Challenge 4. If you win, shift a character token or marker on your cooldown track 2. Uh, so you're just challenging for 4 um, to see if you can win it. And if you get the 4, then you win and you get to move something down too. So that's kind of cool as well. Again, you guys see this should work really nice with certain characters versus other characters. Um, definitely cool. Like I probably want the Invisible Man. Probably wouldn't you want to use the net. Because there's no reason why he would want guys next to him. Um, but definitely neat little cards. Again, you can mix and match these with any other sets. Alright, so then the last thing we have to go through before we look at the board. Is we're going to look well, at the board to look at. But we're going to look at the different modes of play. I zoom back out here. So we have Flags and Control, which is Dracula's Castle. And then we have Leaders and Scrimmage, which is Frankenstein's Lab. Um, so these are all, all... All the games are roughly the same. So they're all going to usually have the same winning conditions. If you score six points with two characters, um, or three characters, you gain, gain ten points to win. Most of the time, um, you're going to gain points for one of two reasons. Knocking out a rival... Um, gains you one point or interacting with point markers across the board will also get you points Then each one has their own special rules. So in flags um, Each player has a starting area um, If you end your turn uh, or The round ends if you are sta uh, standing adjacent To or on a opponent's flag marker you may choose to return one or more of your characters to your starting er area uh, if a character returns to the starting area using the above rule, you gain two points. So basically, if you can get to the opponent's area and be on their flag, you get two points if at the end of the round you're still there. So it's kind of, it's kind of capture the flag. If I still think, and I've said this before in other videos, I think like I'd have a mega just roll, maybe make it worth a little bit more points, maybe up the points in general uh, for some of these special things to make them worth more than just trying to knock guys out or get the... Um, point markers, but make it check to steal the flag and run it back across the field. I think that would be a little bit more fun. Then we have control. Um, this is sort of like uh, King of the Hill, except he's just standing in different areas. So the same thing, uh, 6 and 10 points, 1 point for knocking out characters, 1 point for getting point markers. But it says if any player, any control marker show... Your color at the end of the round, you gain one point. Ignore it when playing with two characters per side. Um, so that's kind of dumb there, because it says ignore this when playing with two characters per side. Uh, because it's okay. Uh, basically, that color doesn't matter. 
Um, it says, if you have the most control markers, showing your color at the end of the round, gaining extra point. So basically what it is, is you want to move your characters into these zones. If you have the most characters on those zones at the end of the round, you gain, you gain a point. Um, again, like, it kind of feels like some of these modes, it's like, the other two options are a little bit easier. Um, I mean, you can kind of go towards them, but, you know, that's what they are. Then on our other side, we have leaders. This is more of a brawling mode. Um, basically, it goes you pick two of your characters to start as leaders. Everyone else goes in your regular starting area. Um, then you gain more points for knocking out characters. So if a leader knocks out another leader, gain four points. So big knocking out, big is four. Uh, an ally knocks out a leader, they gain three points. So a smaller guy knocks out the big guy. Um, if a leader knocks out a smaller guy, you gain two points. If a small guy knocks out a small guy, it's one point. Um, yeah, so basically you have a priority character. If they can do more knocking out, they gain more points. If someone knocks them out, though, they gain a lot. They gain points. Um, other than that, it's just a brawl running around doing stuff there. Then we have scrimmage, which is a little bit different mode. So it says, um, this gets rid of the knocking out point thing, which is kind of nice. Um, so it says rule. Um, each player places their target in the indicated zone. Points target marker can be challenged as a rival. Target markers cannot be moved or removed from the map. The character successfully challenges their target, place that character on their cooldown track. If you're challenging a opponent's target marker and win, gain one point. If your opponent has more points than you, gain two points instead. So the idea is to get over like flags. You're supposed to be there at the end of the game. This one, you gotta run up, do a challenge, and then if you win that challenge, your guy gets removed from the board instead of waiting until the end of the game. So it's very much like flags, except you have to perform a challenge instead. Um, and then you immediately go back. Um, so it's just kind of a little bit different idea there. Um, and they use these little scrimmage markers on there, which have one defense. So instead of just having to stand on the zone, you actually have to do something. Um, alright, then the final thing we want to look at is the actual boards themselves. I'm going to move my box out of the way. Oh. So, we're going to look at, looks like, Dracula's Castle first. Um, and these are very big boards. Now, yeah, you're going to get your guys on here. They're going to take up one square on there. I have stuff underneath this that doesn't want to sit right. Uh, but, yeah, they're going to move around, get these different point things. The big black things are walls, so you can't go around them. Um, these boards are always symmetrical, though. So we have one on each side here, and then we have a little notch there and a little notch there. So on this board, either you have to go through the big open side there, or this side, or the other one, it's the other direction. Uh, so kind of limits where you can go. Now, they have a lot of really cool details on these boards. Um, a lot of times references to whatever the source material is. I'm not going to be for sure all this. We have a carriage with a horse, which is really cool. Um, I love that the door is broken, or that's probably a window, is broken open on this side. And then there's the open doors, so it's kind of showing how you can get into the building. Um, and then this side, it's a wall that got knocked down, or knocked open. Uh, there's some spiders, some different stuff in there. Um, I don't know how much references to the actual Dracula there is. There are some pictures over here of some various characters. Who I'm not sure who those are supposed to be as Dracula's loved ones. Um, although it's Dracula's thing, there's a bed and a table in here. There's a briefcase, which might have a reference. Um, I don't see his coffin, which is something I would have liked to see. But maybe that's not really a big part of the Universal Monsters Dracula. Then on the other side, we have... Um, a lot different styles. You have Frankenstein's Lab. Um, so this is going to, again, still going to be, uh, symmetrical. Square here, square here. Those two are opposite. Those two, those two. Um, but instead of it being big, giant walls, there are little obstacles. So now your guys have to, you know, walk around all these different objects, or they can stand behind it, which will block line of sight. So, you know, uh, 
he can't use a net on Dracula because he can't throw it over the table because it's in his way. Um, so you have to move around and then try and throw something at him. So it kind of adds just a little bit different element to the games. Um, let's look at some of the details on here as well as you can. There's a spider through the doorway. It's just kind of fun. There's, of course, the iconic lab table with all the chains and the lightning catcher. Um, some different stuff. Lots of spider webs everywhere. Um, some books on the table. Here's some more um, things in the bottom, like price body parts and glass jars. So I said, I really would love if they added more characters to this. I was uh, going over with my wife some of the different characters. There's an organ, like, who are the other universal monsters they could add? Clearly, Frankenstein. They just have a regular Frankenstein in here. Uh, the werewolf would be a fun one. Um, have some sort of, like, mechanic with, it, like, the lunar cycle or something like that. Um, they could also do uh, Phantom of the Opera would be one. Um, I thought there was another obvious fourth one that we decided on. Uh, there are some other ones. There's not a ton of ones that are straight up universal monsters. Um, I can't think of what it is right now. I'll, it'll come to me like right after I, I stop this video, I swear. Uh, but yeah, they could do like the two packs that they've done before. They've done that with like... The DC and Jurassic Park and stuff where they released a four-pack box to kind of get everyone started. Then some small two-packs. Or they could do kind of like the other Harry Potter's release a second big pack. Which also would be cool as well. Um, just because it would be harder maybe to get this. I mean, all four of them. Yo, know, let's say what? Dracula, Phantom of the Opera, The Werewolf. And, oh, I was thinking Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde would be a another one. Um, I know there's a couple other different ones too. But they're maybe a little bit more obscure or not as... Well, no one, but that'd definitely be cool if they release this if it sells well enough. Um, they haven't released a second set for every single one necessarily. All right, that's what we got for this Funkoverse Universal Monsters. Hope you guys enjoyed this. Um, check out the rest of them. See you guys later. Bye.